Hi listeners, Jason here. We are excited to finally announce registrations for the biggest psych health and safety community event ever. The inaugural The Psych Health and Safety Conference will be held at the Sofitel Wentworth, Sydney, June 19 to 20, 2024, and offer concurrent virtual attendance. It'll feature live podcast recordings with OG researchers, including Christina Maslak and Michael Leiter of Burnout fame, Psych Health and Safety USA podcast host, I, David Daniels, Australian super experts, including the likes of David Burrows, a special 10 year anniversary integrated approaches to workplace mental health panel with authors, Tony LaMontagna, Angela Martin and Kat Page, handpicked case studies from organizations doing it well, and a very special interview with plaintiff Zaggy Kozarov by Catherine Donlop on that High Court case, which we previously covered on the podcast. This event will sell out. Get in quick to secure tickets at early bird prices for the two-day conference, pre-conference masterclasses, and the VIP dinner. The first 200 in-person registrations also get a copy of her latest book, The Burnout Challenge, signed by Christina Maslach herself. Find out more and register at www.psychhealthandsafetyconference.com. Now, on to this episode. The perception of psychological or physical safety in a workplace or any place is directly connected to the degree of trust a person has in the environment and the people in that environment. But what about a lack of trust that's actually cultural in nature? We're talking with an expert in the concept of cultural mistrust up next on this episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. From Flourish DX, this is the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. As workplace mental health has become a global priority, there's a greater focus on addressing psychosocial hazards. Each episode, we look at psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective. Let's talk psych health and safety. Welcome to this week's Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. I'm your host, Dr. I. David Daniels, and I want to thank you for tuning in. Each week, we seek to increase awareness of the importance of psychological health and safety by learning from the lived experiences, research, and expertise of our guests, as well as advocating strategies to reduce harm and minimize vulnerability to psychosocial hazards in the American workplace. So cultural mistrust is a feeling of suspicion toward people from a culture that's perceived as dominant. It can be caused by a lived experience of being treated in a way that the target of the behavior perceives as threatening or harmful. Cultural mistrust can be described as the tendency to distrust others in personal, institutional, or social contexts. Most of the research into the concept is focused on cultural mistrust as an adaptive attitudinal stance in which persons of a particular, particularly people of color, are suspicious and guarded toward European Americans, particularly European Americans that are in authority positions. It's an adaptive uh, type strategy from a person uh, if one accepts the contention that the current social paradigm is inherently racist. Then a person of color cannot assume that a European American person has his or her best interests at heart. This attitudinal stance was first described in a book by William Greer and Price Cobbs called Black Rage. Greer and Cobbs called this survivalist stance cultural paranoia. Many writers changed that term to cultural mistrust in an effort to emphasize that this is an adaptive strategy rather than a form of psychopathology. So our conversation during this episode will be focused on this concept. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to find someone who's actually studied the concept in depth and helped me understand it a little bit more and help all of us that are listening and tuning in to find out a little bit more about the concept because it does certainly have a role, particularly in the workplace. So let's get started. Uh, as I so often do, with an introduction of my guest by my guest with this question. So who is Dr. Andrea Holman? Well, a loaded question, I would say, Doc. Um, Andrea Holman is a left-handed military child 
that is a black woman, also a counseling psychologist. Um, and just trying to leave the world a little better than she found it. That's who she is in a nutshell. Um, also a mother of two uh, Black boys, um, rambunctious Black boys at that. Um, also work for a uh, former psychology professor turned uh, manager for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging at Lyra Health, uh, a mental health benefits company since 2021. I've been doing that. So that's who, who she is in a nutshell. Okay. Okay. That uh it's interesting you start off with left-handed because <laughs> some of my favorite people are left-handed. My mother is left-handed. It's a delightful uh, group of people. It's a hard life, group of people. But it's yeah. hard, it, it's great life. <laughs> you, you know, it, it it yeah, it's and it's it's another interesting example of how the world is set up for certain people and not so much for other people. I it's actually left handed people a lot. Yes, yes. It's a yes, very yes. uh un- benign example i think that most people can relate to absolutely absolutely and again i don't and we're off on a little bit of a quick rabbit trail here i don't think that was done intentional but it had to do with people who just happened to be right-handed who said hey let's make the desk this way because it works for me and they forgot that everybody was like them There's or they part. said hey this must be disordered or demonic because it's different oh green. So I think it has a lot of, uh, there's intentionality with that description there. I think that has a lot of parallels uh, to the to the minority experience in America, for sure. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts about the concept of psychological health and safety. Yes. So uh, two different things, okay. I would say, that work in, are very synergistic, okay? I think they feed off of each other. I think they're related to each other. Um, but psychologically, being psychologically healthy, I think, does require a level of safety. Uh, I would say like that in terms of their relationship. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to someone recently, and we were talking about psychological safety in, in the workplace. And we we were talking about the ways in which you know, a lot of the narrative that we, I say we, you know, the folks I work with at Lyra Health have this uh, belief that people should show up to work in a way that's authentic and um, to themselves, you know, and you should be able to be all parts of yourself at work and not be able to be penalized or have negative consequences for it. Um, when we're talking about psychological safety, outside of physical yes. safety and the yes. like, right? Yes. Um, but I think an added layer to that for me recently has been that, um it doesn't require that someone be completely vulnerable and transparent. What I think psychological safety means truly for everybody to feel that way is that if you wanted to, you could without fear of retribution, right? So I think it opens up a level of of variability when it comes to how much people want to disclose at work, right? Um, But if you did choose to disclose a level of your identity or bring your a certain uh, visible identity to work, that you don't feel like that's going to be met with some sort of negative outcome. I absolutely love that uh, description because uh, recently I've kind of come to the, uh, the belief that some folks have taken the concept of psychological safety almost too far. And, and here's what I mean by that is they said, Oh, just bring your whole self here and just be yourself and be, and the challenge is you're not set up for that. <laughs> you, the organization wasn't designed to have everybody bring all of themselves all the time. It just wasn't. And frankly, I'm not sure it ever can be. I'm not, I'm not sure that you could have any situation that's set up for every single solitary person to bring all themselves all the time. It is, to your point, the point that uh, the the part of myself I want to bring to accomplish this goal or to get this thing done to to interact with these folks that part when I bring that part that it's going to work and I'm not going to be criticized or tossed out of the group because I happen to see this challenge that we all said we're trying to solve we all said that we were interested in X and my view of it turns out to be slightly different I, I wasn't ta- so we're talking about you know, raising puppies and kittens. I wasn't talking about flying an airplane. So why is it that I get discarded because my way of raising puppies and kittens might be slightly different than yours? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And what if I do raise puppies and kittens? And I just don't really want to talk about that with y'all. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I feel like that's the realistic part, right? Is that I think what's happening now with that narrative that I was talking about, where it's like bring your whole self and transparency. There's something about it where it's like the true um, psychologically safe person or or healthy person is the person that's disclosing everything around the overlap between the personal and the professional where it could be some folks have a mentality at work where they're like, this is not, this is my job. It's a professional setting. I don't really want to talk about all of that, you know, or parenthood is another great example, you know, where it's I, okay, I do have children. I can't avoid talking about that at work because of how it impacts, you know, when and how I show up to work, but I don't really need to talk about that every single day. However, if I needed to, if harm came to my children, I need to take off work. I could, and I don't feel like I'll be penalized for that in that moment. But I think that can be a level of inclusion that we can do is to allow all levels of transparency and variability to be welcome um, while still promoting safety, you know, and, and well-being. Yes, absolutely. Well, good. I, 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 that's the other thing about these conversations is it helped me helps me sometimes figure that I'm not totally alone in that, you know, kind of view that, but because again, I, I have found a particular, because I talk about psychological safety from an occupational health and safety perspective that I get into these discussions around folks are into leadership and, you know, culture and all this other type of thing, which not, not to, to disregard it at all, but it gets a little unrealistic sometimes, you know, because I, I read Dr. Ebbins's book and I was in her seminar and I, I believe. And so they run back to the organization and go, we just all ought to be psychologically safe. Well, oh, oh, oh. Hold up, hold up. This system was not designed to be able to do that. It just wasn't. When we, when the business was started, when the first handful of people were hired, that was not. Now, there are some that are, that I believe that you can, you know, if you started an organization today, you can build it such that, look, one of our core values is the psychological health and safety of people here. But that just didn't happen all that often. It doesn't. Often it's about, uh, we want to make money, and there are other human beings we think can help us make money. So off we go. So off we go. Now, I mean, if you, I think this dovetails nicely into the subject at hand, because when you're talking about safety and health, inside or outside of work, you will talk about trust. You have to, right? Um, and so that's what safety means, because you cannot control or guarantee any outcomes in life as as people not even just as professionals. So you have to talk about the level of trust that you have in the people around you to get yourself safe, right? And so when you're talking about these things weren't created, et cetera, et cetera, well, uh, when we're talking about systemic, either inequalities or racism or um, the like, and the, the institutions that came out of that, inherent uh, discrimination kind of inequality, it's not set up for everybody to trust everybody, right? And so you go into a system that inherently feels unsafe because of what's gone on in the world, um, even if it is safe, you know, and that's where the cultural mistrust comes in. You know, I think that's where um, talking about these two topics together, I think is very appropriate. Sure. So, so sh share a little bit more. A again, I, I'm trying to think if before... I met you, I knew what cultural mistrust even was. To be quite honest, I don't know that I had heard of the concept before. I, as, as I dig into it and start to understand, I go like, oh, that's what it is. It's putting language to things that we certainly experience. But so tell me what, if someone asks you, what is cultural mistrust? What, what would you share with them? Now, I will say, though, as an aside to what you're saying is very, um, is not surprising at all. Okay, it's very on brand with uh, my professor days when I taught a course psychology of the African-American experience, and I would bring up cultural mistrust. If there were students in the class um, who were either identified as Black or African-American or just kind of person of color, when I described what that was, it wasn't that they now had a new vocabulary term, this new phenomenon that they were aware of. They usually responded with, there's a name for that? People, I thought that was just life, right? And so it's really there, it's being described for them, right? Um, in contrast, when you've got the racial privilege, then it becomes this phenomenon, oh, that's a, okay, I wasn't really aware that that was a thing. So you've got two different psychological experiences when people are talking about this mistrust. 
Um, so I would even encourage folks, you know, depending on where you are, how you show up in the world, consider how it is that you digest that definition, you know, uh, whether you doubt its truth or accuracy, whether you feel like it just describes something about you um, or what, you know, I think that that in itself can be a learning experience. Uh, but my definition definitely comes from Greer and Cobbs, like you mentioned, um, from Black Rage. When when you did mention the uh, the adaptive response, right, that there is something around, because the, the idea of cultural mistrust came from the Black community. That, that's where it's an inception. That's where it began to be talked about and researched first. So it is this inherent belief that white Americans cannot be trusted. Okay, that's that's it point blank. The part that I think is so key and fascinating, you mentioned the adaptive response, but it's also a conditioned response. And that's the part I think is great to, that's often missed. Conditioned response, when you talk about um, the kind of psychological experience of people and how they learn, a lot of it's through conditioning, right? If, you, if you're familiar at all with like Pavlov's dogs, you know, you ring the bell, the salivation, all of that, that's conditioning. You put two things together long enough, and you'll associate one of the things with another thing, okay? Um, that's what conditioned response is. When you have a mistrust, if you put together the maltreatment of you or people that look like you long enough with a certain group of people that perpetrate that, you'll start to associate the maltreatment with that group of people. That's how brains work. They're anticipating things. That's how we like to do it. It's sufficient sometimes, you know, um, to see things coming. And so the conditioning part is the part that I think speaks to the reality of the experience of Black Americans um, when it comes to cultural mistrust and other groups of, of color that have been talked about in that sense. But um, for, we'll stay specific with that one group when we're talking about. Uh, so, so when you mentioned the thing about the cultural paranoia in that piece, that shift in language was very important because what we don't want, remember I talked about the experience of hearing that. What we don't want is people to doubt it skeptical. These, they're delusional. They've made that. I haven't experienced anything like that. Or I mean, I didn't do anything to them. So why are they acting like this? Why are they responding in this way? And that questioning then becomes a questioning of their actual sanity or place in reality. They're not out of touch of reality. They're paying attention is what they're doing with cultural mistrust. So you do that enough. You mistreat people or, or and or they hear enough stories of people being mistreated and they will then start to say me with someone that looks like you is not going to end well, right? That's what they're going to believe and it will feel true, even if it's not technically true in that moment at that time. Wow. That, um, that starts to explain or describe a lot. It really does. It, 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 it really, really, really does because there, a, as you're speaking, there's so many thoughts that go through my mind about, uh, again, not only the black experience, but again, the point of I'm in my, I'm in a position that is, uh, perceived or, or described as subservient to someone else. That power that the other person has that starts to create that condition, at least to me. I mean, I, so I, I came up in, for many, many years in the fire rescue service, which is very hierarchical. There's the chief, and then there's the officers, and the, kind of like the military, same type of hierarchical structure. And uh, you get conditioned that privates don't talk, firefighters don't talk, police officers don't talk when captains, they, they, they sit quietly, or managers are speaking and the workers don't talk. This hierarchy that create, gets created in the workplace often becomes an obstacle to the safety of the person who is not in the power position and sometimes to the person who is because there's not that free communication of, I realize the hierarchy here, but that's not, that doesn't feel good or that doesn't look right. Or, and, and often workers won't, you know, I, I, <laughs> there are a lot of folks who get seriously injured and killed, not because they didn't recognize a hazard, but because they didn't say anything about it. They just kind of powered through it because they don't get the opportunity to talk. If if I want to know your opinion, I'll kind of squeeze it out of you. That that type of thing, you know. Absolutely. Um, so it it absolutely correlates with that um, 
ability, because that's part of what trust is, right? Is that I can actually say, and safety, psychological safety, is being able to speak up and, ha- and believe that this need will be met and kind of heard from the person that I'm speaking to. When you've got enough evidence to say that that's not the case, um, you just you just won't, you'll stop. Um, you'll stop trying. So it absolutely happens. So, so, so what leads you to study uh, cultural mistrust as an academic pursuit? Sure, yeah. So um, as a former academic, I guess I can say now technically, now that I'm a few years out of the game, um, I noticed something happening. So um, I decided to do my dissertation research on this topic, cultural mistrust, because I realized in in the psychological world, very few of psychologists were black. Okay, less than five percent for sure. I think the number's gone up to maybe three or four. <laughs> That's about it. Um, not a lot. Kept reading, kept reading about this whole oh racial matching and cultural congruence. You know, this type of thing helps in therapy. But I can't get past this number, right? So I'm thinking, wait, if, if, and then I'm hearing, you know, that um, a lot of Black Americans are uh, misdiagnosed, maybe, or potentially overdiagnosed with certain types of things. Um, so we've got an issue here, and people need the help-seeking attitudes are not great for a whole other host of reasons. Uh, we still got this small number, so I'm thinking, okay, if people need help, there's not a lot of people that look like them to help them. Their odds are they're probably going to go to someone who does not look like them. What then? Right? That's that's what I thought. And so then I came upon this, this construct of cultural mistrust and I thought, oh, that's it, right? Um, that explains it, is that there might be this potential for breakdown in the therapy room because that will be a representation or microcosm of greater society. They say, no, nope, I'm not. You think I'm going to tell you my deepest, darkest to be more vulnerable with you than I've been with anybody else? Experience shows me. Remember that condition response? People like you don't believe people like me or it'll be met with some sort of prejudice, discrimination, microaggression, lack of understanding. You just won't get it. You know, simple ignorance. Actual maltreatment. You know, there's people who have actually been mistreated um, in those those pieces. And so you read um, Harry Washington's Medical Apartheid and you'll get a whole litany of ways that Black folks have been mistreated um, in the medical profession. So when you've got all that coming into the therapy room with somebody across you, but you still need help, right? So you're still in the distress you're in. You just don't trust this person to help you. And there's not a lot of folks that look like you to help you. So now what are we supposed to do? Um, and so that's where I started to become fascinated with this topic and what's going on is that people that have high cultural mistrust, do they just not trust people? Like, is that just a general thing? That's what I, and my research says that that's not exactly the case. These are two distinct phenomena. Um, and so that was pretty interesting to me, um, to find out it's sort of correlated, but not enough to really hang your hat on to just say, oh, if you don't trust it, as a black American, you don't trust white folks and you just somebody who just doesn't trust people. That's not necessarily the case. No, no. I, again, I, I hear a lot of parallels between uh, your experience and mine researching uh, the lived experience of Black workers' exposure to psychosocial hazards. Be- because first of all, what's a psychosocial hazard in the occupational safety and health community? There's not a lot of understanding about e- what, not in this country anyway, because the OSH Act doesn't address it. It, 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 it kind of skirts around it a little bit. So there's 19,700 or so words in the act, and it mentions the word psychological twice. Uh, there are a couple of, you know, th- there's a mention that uh, in terms of recording injuries, it, yeah, if it's mental in nature and you can get a mental health profession to, to, to justify what you felt, then maybe you can record that. But we, even if you were to go to OSHA today, and say, well, look, I've been emotionally damaged at work. They go, well, you know, we don't really have a standard. We don't have a lot of standards on a lot of things. That's what the general duty clause is for. <laughs> but so so that, that's one part of it. But then uh, in my literature review, I, I struggled to find, and I, frankly, I don't recall finding any, any literature about the safety of Black workers and the few that were written were not written by Black people. And I, you would find that with virtually all literature on occupational safety, most of it is written by white men. And it's not that it's bad research. 
It's that it lacks the perspective of folks who aren't white men. And I, 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 you know, and again, I say that to try to, you know, soften the blow and not come across as sometimes kind of angry at the system. <laughs> but, but, but that's the reality is we have so many things that were created by one group, created by white people, by men, by able-bodied people, by straight people, by whoever. And then we want to say, oh, let's just take this system and have everybody else fit it as opposed to apply to everybody, as opposed to, well, hold up. Perhaps we should design something that works for all the people we say it's supposed to work for. How about that? That'd be harder. <laughs> but, but, oh my goodness. Uh, so. <laughs> no, it's a lot. It's a whole lot. And I will say too, I think just to like meet potential naysayers where they are, right? Okay. Let me just name this. Cause you mentioned this whole like psychological dimension twice in this, in this thing. And I think sometimes what happens when we're talking about health, safety, all of this stuff, these conversations around psychological safety or emotional damage, like you're saying, start to feel real, like, unnecessary. You know, like, you just need to be, you're being, like, too sensitive. You know, uh, folks just need to go do their work, get their paycheck, and go home. Why are we talking about all of that? Take care of that on your own. Uh, but there is a business case for being psychologically safe at work, too. We'll name it. Because people quit. Or they get hurt. Yep, right? that's exactly right. If you do right. not trust your teammates, especially if you're doing something regarding manual labor, that could hurt you, you know? It's, yes, mm -hmm. or kill you. Or Yes. Um, yes. Quiet quitting, that whole phenomenon that was trending for a while, I think that has a lot to do um, in terms of trust, inclusion, belonging. So these things matter and affect the bottom line. So if you want people to be hired and stay where they are uh, for the long haul, rather than having to rehire, retrain, all of that stuff, it behooves you to actually talk about this stuff and take it seriously. Do you need more psych health and safety in your life? Then head over to the Flourish GX Academy for several free on-demand e-learning courses. If you're an internal professional, follow Flourish GX on Eventbrite to register for any of our free fortnightly interactive webinars. Our flagship professional practice program is also exclusively available for internal professionals. The 12-week course blends theory, applied practice, and interaction with other professionals through live lectures and a monthly community of practice session. Find out more about all these learning opportunities or inquire about a bespoke in-house training at the Flourish DX Academy. www.45003.org. Now back to this episode. Well, the, the latest data I've seen suggests that a person, the average person is going to stay in their job 4.1 years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, but we have systems who continue to say, oh yeah, we want to have people who want to be employees for life. We don't even have benefits for life. There aren't the pension systems and things that used to encourage people to stay for 30 years. And, and, and on top of that, uh, folks are getting a little smarter than they used to be and they have more options than they used to have because uh, for you to, first of all, in some cases, the recruitment process itself is the first uh, situation where people distrust and, and feel unsafe. Because why is it that I have to fill out 17 screens or 17 pieces of paper and interview with 15 people for a job that's going to pay almost nothing? And, and, um, and this is a bit of a rabbit trail here, but I, I really struggle with the concept of, uh, background uh, of employment history and all that. Why does that matter? Why does it matter? My experience at the last employer, w w you're not going to check the employer out. You're going to check me out. And, and what doesn't get talked about is how that employer has really high turnover because they really aren't kind to people. They, they grind people up and toss them out like, like, you know, like disposable something. But then it's the individual who gets labeled as a quote unquote job hopper, whatever the case might be. Uh, and if you've noticed that, why is it that all of those people just happen to be women or people of color? Or why is it those happen to be gay people or disabled people? Or, so, so again, we have just an entire system that is kind of too focused on the wrong thing. The question is, can the person perform in this environment and do the things that we need them to do with us? So, so then if you take that a step further, I think hiring folks 
it's a, it's a great question to ask is what metrics am I using to, to draw that conclusion that this person is competent enough to do this job? Yes, you've got your stuff on paper. That's all well and good. I'm asking you to look beyond that. Because let me tell you how people, it's a conditioned response, cultural mistrust, right? Let's go back to that. So if you've got enough experience to say, if I don't straighten my hair, right? If my name is this, there's tons of research on this already. What gets labeled as professional? What gets seen as competent? What does my accent tell you? Okay. Um, And getting real honest with that type of stuff. To say, how am I actually evaluating? Because people can pick up on that. They can recognize that. That stuff is real, that bias. And so when you when you live a life navigating that most of the time, you even enter, to your point, you enter even just the hiring phase before the onboarding and all of that with a level of mistrust and expectations there, uh, which can maybe just further be affirmed the longer you're at a particular institution. That's that's exactly right, and and then you know, and I, I I'll admit I do have a bit of confirmation bias, like most folks. Uh, then then I go and see things that kind of reinforce what I already believe about it situations like happens. this with people like this, and uh, I, I'm I live where I live right now, very intentionally, very very intentionally, because I had an experience that caused me not to want to be in an environment where I was a minority. Literally. It Absolutely. Doesn't take mu- it doesn't take a dozen experiences. It can be one, two, where you like, never again. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Never absolutely. again. Yeah. And then, yeah. like I said, you don't even have to live through it. There are stories that are passed down to see the experiment, right? Uh, different things like that. Because part of, um, I'm going to use a big term called racial socialization. So that's the way in which... Uh, You've got young black and brown kids that are raised, what they're told from their parents about who they are racially and ethnically. One of those pieces they've done research on is prep for bias, preparation for bias and promotion. Or another piece is uh, is promotion of mistrust. So we've got two pieces here where you've got family, loved ones, parents, people who are helping raise and kind of mold you, telling you, hey, there's bias out there. You might not trust these folks, okay? Don't go over here by yourself in the dark. Don't go with them people, you know? Um, And so they're promoting that type of mistrust. Now, again, it's an adaptive, like you said, response. It's something that is supposed to meant to help you survive, right? But I think at points, it can be a bit of a confirmation bias, like you're saying, uh, where you're so prepared that you can't actually um, experience, that there might be some um, benign experiences or, you know, positive. That's right. That, mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I heard once that sometimes people are so prepared for war, even in the time of peace, their weapons are always out. Always out. Guarded. Take it in another, if, you, if you're having a hard time with race, to put it in gender, put it in another identity where you've had someone who has been um, harmed in some way or abused by the same type of person, the same gender, only by men, for example. They start to not fool with men, right? And they're like, mm-hmm, I got it. Conditioning. That's what you do. That's what your brain is trying to do to keep you to endure and to keep you surviving. It's just there are men that you could meet who are not that way. And they're yes. going to have to deal with the consequences of this. That's, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And I, I, so much of this is just so important. And, and I, there are likely... HR professionals and managers and others that are listening to this going, oh, there's just so much. Yeah, there is so much. There, it is. It, it, is um, it is a very complex web we're trying to weave or, assist, or, or scaffolding we're trying to build. When you bring human beings into another set of human beings, and that's really where the most of the work is, is you're already there. You're, you're in there for whatever your reason is. The challenge is when you bring on new people. That, that's that's really where the work needs to be done is how and I and, and frankly I, I'll I'll be honest it was a, a a white man who told me this and I never forgot it he said look great organizations should not take great people uh, uh, should not take great people and try to make them like the people who are already there they should try to become like the people they're bringing in every time you bring in a new person there's something you add some because you brought them in for a reason. And so why is it that, they, oh, we've got to mold you to our culture? Well, no, our culture, yes, to make it a fit. No, our culture, our 
environment needs to mold more to you because we said we wanted you. We said we wanted you here. I, again, my, you know, another fire rescue experience, the city of Seattle hired its first female firefighter in 1977. The department had been around since 1889, but took that long to figure out that, hey, maybe women could do this. And it took seven years before somebody figured out that perhaps the restroom situation should be adapted to people who were not male. Seven years? Really? Does it really take that long? And women were saying that, they just weren't being heard until they decided to take the city to court. And, and I, again, roll that all the way back to, again, the conversations I have about psychological health and safety. The, the, the data, I don't need a I don't need a dissertation, a 15 page study. I, I need the data that comes from the human being that says, this doesn't feel right to me. That's data. So now what are we going to do with that? Absolutely. Because what, here, what gonna- this is why it matters to me at the end of the day, because your example is a brilliant example. I think also if you've hit seen uh, Hidden Figures, you've seen that whole restroom example played out again. So it's not even just firefighters. But, but here's what I'm thinking is that that type of uh, lack of inclusion and thought is stressful, okay? It's wears on the body and the mind and having to navigate all that, literally find a place, you know, to bring your body back to equilibrium. That's a whole lot. Stress is stress is stress. The body does not discriminate against that. So if we're talking about prolonging people's lives and moving them from surviving to thriving, we have to talk about this stuff. Um, That's why it truly does matter. Right, absolutely. So is there... It, are, are there strategies or ideas that you have about how individuals can uh, minimize their cultural distrust of others? Starting, so how, how do I work on me so I have, uh, I'm, I'm better at that? Sure. I think, you know, when I first started doing this work, my advisor at the time, he said, so question for you. You know, as we're looking up this cultural mistrust stuff, he said, so what's the goal here? Right? What are you doing? Are you trying to get people to not be culturally mistrust, you know, to lower the cultural mistrust and to just say they should trust the people? Are you saying that this is a wrong response? My answer, and I think it's a great question, you know, because if we're saying, hey, this can prevent you from certain relationships or, you know, all of these type of things, what's the subtext there? You know, I don't think that it is something to completely eradicate until you show me in America, okay? Or a world that is absolutely devoid of discrimination, harm, race-based injustice. That's when you don't need it anymore, is what I'm thinking. Oh, okay? yeah. um, that's right. where the world where that lives in. Until that's the case, there's always some sort of chance, okay? So I think that it is simply realistic um, to have some level of guardedness, uh, to say, ooh, so, you know, some kind of spidey senses. But here's the thing about it. We should do that in life, really. Not just, I mean, where is it in life where you just blindly trust, you know, anybody, any everybody with everything? We don't do that. You wisely discern and figure out what evidence do I have, you know, for continuing to behave in a certain way. I think that's good critical thinking skills. I think that's what you need in tandem with cultural mistrust, is to look around evident, uh, situation to situation, be aware of the mistrust that's happening and say, is there evidence that I have to the contrary of this? What's actually going on with this person? Have they given me any sort of reason to <laughs> run the other direction, you know, or continue to take the risk to engage? Because it will not, feel, if you're, especially if you're high in cultural mistrust, it's not gonna feel natural or intuitive to do that. But I think there's a slow way in which, how is it that I can get my goals met, especially at the workplace? You know, how can I get my goals met, my relationship goals met outside of work in a way that, that also maintains my safety? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the, 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 the definition of a psychosocial hazard is a psychosocial factor that's perceived or experienced by the person exposed as a threat to them that in turn affects their behavior. And so again, another wonderful connection. It is important that we have, that we allow our bodies to do what our bodies do, particularly what our brain does. Yeah. And our amygdala fires 
because of something that it, it happens in a set because of our perception of a threat. It's, and I heard from neuroscience that we are taking in about or processing about 11 million bits of information per second. And we pay a lot of attention. The brain pays attention about 40 or 50 and it's looking for the threats. It's look, because but where, that, and that's the thing, where did that come from? So I think that's where you, <laughs> look, you're right. Okay. So how do I know that this is, what am I, what's happened to me to make me perceive this as a threat? Okay. Um, and so that's the type of thing that I want people to be more attuned in. I think that self-awareness to say, hey, my spidey senses are going off. I feel a mistrust here. Why? For what reason? What's gone on? Right. Um, is my body just reacting from a, a conditioned response it's just used to, you know, um, or is there really a truly reason to be a bit mistrustful here? A absolutely. Yeah. And and that's that's also where the where the conversation and communication with the other party or parties that I'm with really matters. Because again, to me, I'm doing fine. You're not. And the question is, is this an environment where you can say, huh, I'm just kind of feeling something. And that, again, back to our earlier conversation about psychological safety. Is it okay for the person to say, you know, I, I know we've done it that way before, but there's something about that that yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not really feeling really good about that. Particularly when we have the discretionary time to talk about it. Uh, if we don't have discretionary time, that's where practice, that's where procedures or those things kick in to say, look, we, if and again, you know, I use a lot of these examples because it's you know because it's ones that I have. But if we're getting ready to go into a extremely hazardous situation and everybody on the team's not with it, we none of us should do it then. If we're not all good. Uh, and we used to have this, you know, we get up on the porch of a house on fire and look around and if everybody didn't give the thumbs up, we're not going in, period. We don't stop and talk. We just stop and we back away because and it doesn't matter what their reason is. Maybe their their respirator isn't working. Maybe it's stress in there, but it uh, doesn't matter. We back away, reassess, and then we'll take a, a run at it later if we decide to do that at all. But I, again, I think what, what I've seen in a lot of situations that are not certainly that critical is that this is the way we do it. Everybody runs whole hog into it. And there's that one person going like, this doesn't they, feel good they, to you me. You can see it on their face too. They clear, they're like, mm. then when it all goes up in flames, I guess to use your analogy, then they're like, I, I knew. Exactly. I that, but That's I exactly right. Right. Yeah. 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 And then to ask yourself, so why is it that I don't feel that that should be a sign? And I don't feel safe enough to be able to bring that up. That I, that says something about both me and them. It really does. It really does. Now, I will say yeah. back to the therapy dynamic. One of the things that can help with that mistrust piece is something called broaching. So when you've got that um, interracial dynamic um, or cross kind of ethnic dynamic, in the therapy room for somebody to have the security and the knowledge to say, hey, I'm aware that there's, you know, of the difference here between a, how is it that this identity shows up for you? How is it that you want to talk about this or really um, incorporate this into your healing journey or your counseling journey or what have you? So when people are not afraid of that subject, but can, can talk about it in a way that's secure and confident and patient with that person and truly see and validate what they're doing, that helps. I would venture to say, if I was a betting woman, that that also works at work. Uh, that if you can be aware of your specific team dynamics, aware of how you show up and how that might impact the perceived safety that somebody else feels across identities and talk about it proactively, not just when everything's hit the fan, right? Um, on the inside, in onboarding, okay? If you can really have that kind of conversation um, and recognize that as time goes on, you know, and be patient with folks to allow them to feel safe enough to be vulnerable. I think you're doing something truly impactful. Right. So, so I, I, uh, uh, another thing just before we start to wrap it up here. Um, I, I think this comes across to me in my head and to others when I say it as utopian, when I talk about the that I honestly believe that you can design uh, systems and design organizations to be psychologically healthy and safe for pe for human beings. I, I I just believe that with my core. I I think we don't pay enough attention to it, 
but I think it can be done. And so if you were giving uh, advice, assistance, suggestions to someone who is, so you're still really small, or maybe there's just you and you, you we want to bring on some other human beings, uh, what suggestions would you give them to be able to create this or to establish this environment where their the cultural mistrust is recognized and and we kind of understand what's going on and we want to help folks in that way. How, what would you suggest? Sure. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, one of the first things that I think of is um, one of the one of the things I've employed on my team is this uh, form to fill out. So once someone is hired, it's called All About You because I couldn't think of anything else. Um, but that's what it's called. But it has a lot of questions on it that are not exactly related to work and job performance. So it'll it'll have things on there that are just kind of get to know you stuff like what personality test do you like? What's your Enneagram number or your Myers Briggs? You know, those t- are you introverted or extroverted, those type of things. But also has things on there like what are the signals that you have for being overworked or burned out? How would I know? What how would you start what's your change in behavior? What are the identities that you think I need to know about you as we start this work? Um what are certain, are there certain accommodations or um, um, accessibility needs that you might have um, that you need to either talk about with me or with HR? Um, all of those type of things. Um, so that you you can really start to, what, is, what does um, regular check-ins look like for your mental health? What would be helpful for you in terms of cadence or frequency? So it's very specific to you as a person. But I think as you create teams and grow an organization, if you look at how the group dynamic changes based on that and what people might need and indicators that they don't feel safe, because we all have them, we usually just bypass it real fast and go straight to fight or flight, right? Um, or, for, or draw conclusions about folks. I don't mess with them like that. I don't know them like that. I don't trust them, you know, all that stuff. Nobody's spoken anything. All right. So the, the person that we're talking about it, we haven't broached, none of that's happened. But I think if we can make these things more explicit, proactively more explicit, it's not that much work, I promise. OK, so I know if there's HR folks listening, you're like, no, nah, I'm not about to go make a whole thing. You just look, pay attention, listen, you know, and respond appropriately. I think that's a huge piece um, that and, and then I think also being secure in your own identity. Is that, can I? <laughs> you didn't do that, did you? I did. I said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The insecurity starts to, it's, it's another red flag for mistrust. You like, see, this is why I can't talk to you about stuff. Because you get so uh, anxious, you know, around the topic of race or racism. But if you can be secure enough to say, hey, I can name things that have happened that were unjust or, or microaggressive or, you know, harmful of safety, we can talk about that and repair us all human relationships are is a dance between rupture and repair. So if you can be secure enough in that, you know, in your imperfections, in your how you show up to work, I think that starts to be felt by your employees. And I think it's safer to me. Yes. Yes. Wow. Uh, I could uh, I could swim in these waters for quite a while, but uh, then we'd be. Yeah, <laughs> because they should be safe waters. Yeah, yeah right. Um, so, uh, if if folks wanted to have further conversations about topics of this nature, uh, what's 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 the best way to to find out more about you and about the the organization? Oh, conversation with me. Oh, <laughs> seriously, or or, or the, how, how how could people find out more? Fine. Yes, about the mist. So, I think reading is great. Um, again, like the medical apartheid book, I think is a wonderful place to start. Um, and then if you're also even looking, there's a book, Black Fatigue, um, that's that's pretty interesting to me too, about kind of the impacts of that kind of racial stress um, and mistrust. Because I think it just offers a good piece of validation um, that this is, this is something that's real, that's a result of folks paying attention and not having a distorted perception on life. So I would start with the reading there. You don't have to watch movies like Get Out, even though you could. <laughs> but... If you want a, another depiction of the business. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, that yeah, might yeah. further affirm your your beliefs, though. So maybe don't do that. Uh, but I think that's a great place to start. Uh, I think, honestly, even talking about if you have other people in your life uh, that identify 
as folks of color because they've done some research around like you Latinx folks, uh, Asian Americans. There's other groups of people that have feelings of mistrust, you know, particularly around medical professions too. And so even if you wanted to converse with them, hey, how does, how does this thing called cultural mistrust, how does it show up uh, for you in your life? And you might be surprised at some of the responses, honestly. Right, right. Oh boy. Well, thank thank you. Thank you very, very much. I I, I feel like we didn't go to school or church. I'm not no, sure which one. Both? I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps a little bit of both. But yeah, th- thanks. Thanks so much. I, I, there is such a connection between this concept and how people feel uh, in the workplace and in other places. But, you know, a lot of these conversations about safety of all kinds, they really do start at work. It's not as if they necessarily come up at home unless they're, you know, in or around folks such as yourself. So get that. Thanks. Thanks very much. And um, if you're watching this episode on the Flourish DX YouTube page, please do like, subscribe, and share. You want to get this out. When other folks get an opportunity to both see it and hear it. If you're watching or listening to this podcast for the first time, welcome. I hope something that you've heard will bring you back in the future. Previous episodes of the podcast can be found at psychhealthandsafetyusa.com. I'd also encourage you to reach out to us and join the Psych Health and Safety USA movement by connecting to us on LinkedIn. So until our next episode, thanks very much. We'll uh, have some more information for you next time on the next episode of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. Tune in each Friday for new episodes of the Psych Health and Safety USA podcast. If you have a story or know of one that needs to be told, reach out to us on LinkedIn or send an email to david at id2-solutions.com or go to the Flourish DX website at flourishdx.com. We'll see you next time.